Thank you for attending Forbidden Library. Put banned books, challenge books, and censorship in our world, also known as a slippery slope. For those of you who are not students, staff, or faculty, welcome to Endergaard College. We are glad that you are here. We are grateful that all of you are taking the time to learn with us. The reason why we wanted to have this program is because of the recent and disturbing uptick in banned or challenged books in this country. So this program is not about telling you what is right or wrong. It's about delving into the complexity of censorship and what is at stake. We are presenting this information because we hope that you will take this knowledge and view censorship with a more critical eye and keep the conversation going. In the presentation, you will learn about what is a banned or challenged book, a little history, current trends, and then we will go, we'll open it up to Q&A. And of course, a raffle. Make sure you have entered the raffle and make sure, and I'm sorry about the poll, I guess we hit our maximum, but thank you for those who, who did it. So, with all that said, I would like to introduce to you Endicott's esteemed professor of English, Dr. Sharon Paradiso. Professor Paradiso teaches a course in banned books, among other interesting and thought-provoking courses. Our one and only library director, Brian Kordamach. Hello. Uh, one of the amazing library, reference librarians, we have Melissa over here, and we also have Eleanor. And last but not least, Arden Noring. Arden is an outstanding student at Endicott College, and they are the heart and soul of this program. Thank you, Arden, for your extraordinary work. So. So, with that all said, we thought that this video would be a good way to start our presentation. So, pardon? And we'd just like to quickly apologize because this video keeps causing a lot of technical issues with uh, the audio, but it should work pretty well for now. <laughs> It was a pleasure to burn. It was a special pleasure to see things eaten, to see things blackened and changed. Fahrenheit 451 opens in a blissful blaze, and before long, we learn what's going up in flames. Ray Bradbury's novel imagines a world where books are banned from all areas of life, and possessing, let alone reading them, is forbidden. The protagonist, Montag, is a fireman responsible for destroying what remains. But as his pleasure gives way to doubt, the story raises critical questions of how to preserve one's mind in a society where free will, self-expression, and curiosity are under fire. In Montag's world, mass media has a monopoly on information, erasing almost all ability for independent thought. On the subway, ads blast out of the walls, at home, Montag's wife, Mildred, listens to the radio around the clock, and three of their parlor walls are plastered with screens. At work, the smell of kerosene hangs over Montag's colleagues, who smoke and set their mechanical hound after rats to pass the time. When the alarm sounds, they surge out in salamander-shaped vehicles, sometimes to burn whole libraries to the ground. But as he sets tomes ablaze day after day like black butterflies, Montag's mind occasionally wanders to the contraband that lies hidden in his home. Gradually, he begins to question the basis of his work. Montag realizes he's always felt uneasy, but has lacked the descriptive words to express his feelings in a society where even uttering the phrase once upon a time can be fatal. Fahrenheit 451 depicts a world governed by surveillance, robotics, and virtual reality, a vision that proved remarkably prescient, but also spoke to the concerns of the time. The novel was published in 1953, at the height of the Cold War. This era kindled widespread paranoia and fear throughout Bradbury's home country of the United States, amplified by the suppression of information and brutal government investigations. In particular, this witch-hunt mentality targeted artists and writers who were suspected of communist sympathies. Bradbury was alarmed at this cultural crackdown. He believed it set a dangerous precedent for further censorship, and was reminded of the destruction of the Library of Alexandria and the book-burning of fascist regimes. He explored these chilling connections in Fahrenheit 451, titled after the temperature at which paper burns. The accuracy of that temperature has been called into question, but that doesn't diminish the novel's standing as a masterpiece of dystopian fiction. 
Dystopian fiction as a genre amplifies troubling features of the world around us and imagines the consequences of taking them to an extreme. In many dystopian stories, the government imposes constrictions onto unwilling subjects. But in Fahrenheit 451, Montag learns that it was the apathy of the masses that gave rise to the current regime. The government merely capitalized on short attention spans and the appetite for mindless entertainment, reducing the circulation of ideas to ash. As culture disappears, imagination and self-expression follow. Even the way people talk is short-circuited, such as when Montag's boss, Captain Beatty, describes the acceleration of mass culture. Speed up the film, Montag, quick, click, pit, look, I, now, flip, here, there, swift, pace, up, down, in, out, why, how, who, what, where, uh, uh, bang, smack, walla, bing, bong, boom, digest, digests, digest, digest, digests, politics, one column, two sentences, a headline, then in midair, all vanishes. In this barren world, Montag learns how difficult it is to resist when there's nothing left to hold on to. Altogether, Fahrenheit 451 is a portrait of independent thought on the brink of extinction and a parable about a society which is complicit in its own combustion. Dive into other works of... I've seen that video several times, and I have to tell you, each time I see it, I get a chill. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Does that sound familiar to you? How many of you have read Fahrenheit, for, uh, Fahrenheit 451? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, Ray Bradbury is quoted as saying, there is more than one way to burn a book, and the world is full of people running around about with lit matches. A fun fact about Ray Bradbury, he was hesitant to have his work converted to e-books. Probably not a surprise, right? He told the Los Angeles Times in an interview in 2010, we have too many cell phones, we've got too many intranets, that's not a mistake, he said intranets, We've got to get rid of those machines. We have too many machines now. Just so you know, Fahrenheit 451 is now available as an e-book. So. <laughs> so we're going to move on to what is a challenged and a banned book. And Arne's going to take over. So um, according to the American Library Association, also known as the ALA, uh, challenges do not simply involve a person expressing a point of view. Rather, a uh, challenge is an attempt to remove or restrict materials based upon objections of a person or group. And most challenges do not result in bans, thankfully. So this is a graphic from the American Library Association. I'm probably gonna to refer to it as ALA for now on, but just so you know. Uh, it talks about, there were 5,200 challenge, there are about 5,200 challenges every year. 156 challenges were tracked by the American Library Association in 2020. And there are 58 challenges listed in the field report for 2020. We found 2019, I can't find 2020, but that is a field report. And it lists all the books, the authors, a little description of the book, and it also tells you the source of the challenge, or the ban, but it's the, first it's the challenge. So, I'm gonna go down here. So if you looked at the graphic, it said, silent challenges, 82 to 97% of challenges remain unreported. You may ask, how do they know that? Because that's what we asked. Um, actually, that's what they were asked. And um, we don't know. Uh, we couldn't find the answer. But I did uh, email the Office of Intellectual Freedom and ask them that question. So we'd like to set up, I have all your emails. Um, if there are any questions tonight that you have that we can't answer, you know, when I hear this, when I get this answer, I will certainly share them with you because I, I would like to know how they, they know about that. So, um, all right. Okay, so we've already covered challenges. What is banning then? Um, so as you can see, in the case of books, banning is the removal of challenge material. Um, and more general terms, um, banning is to officially or legally prohibit or the omission of materials. And we have looked into the number um, of challenge books that actually get banned. Um, we have not been able to find a statistic about that from the ALA. But as stated in the challenge slide, most challenges do not result in bans. This is a graphic that the ALA does every year. This is from this is from 2020. You could go onto the website and see a list of material that has been challenged or banned starting from 1990. Uh, have you all heard of Banned Book Week? 
sure that you... I just got a little, just a little research on it. According to the ALA, Banned Book Week was launched in the 1980s, I think it was 82, during a time of increased challenges, organized protests, in the Island Tree School District versus Pico, which was a 1982 Supreme Court split in ruling which stated that the school officials cannot ban books in libraries simply because of their content. The American Library Association does not ban books, just so you know. Okay. Um, so that leads nicely into the section which covers the history of book bans and challenges. Um, I would like to reintroduce uh, Professor Paradiso. Um, she teaches a number of courses related to some of the topics that we're going to be covering, um, such as discourses of masculinity and literary criticism and interpretation. And one that relates directly to this is the Banned Books course, which if anyone is here, you might want to take that. <laughs> I want to take it. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Arden. <Arlene. laughs> um, so, the First Amendment of the United States Constitution um, is, is pretty small. It's not, there's not a lot to it. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of, re of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. That's the important part for us or the right of the people peaceably to assemble uh, and to petition the government for redress of grievances. So, <clears throat> abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. Um, over the, the years, um, the court has interpreted that um, uh, in increasingly widely, um, broadly, I should say. Um, but there are some exceptions to that. Um, speech can be uh, uh, restricted if it is libel, slander, incitement, or obscenity. So libel, slander, and incitement don't come up too often, in, uh, especially in school and library uh, challenges and bans. So if you really want to ban a book, you've got to find a way to make it obscene. <laughs> So I'll give you uh, an overview of how the case law has um, evolved in light of the First Amendment. Um, much of uh, US law in, in the beginning of the nation um, was borrowed from English law. Um, and there's no First Amendment in England. Um, so the king could impose speech restrictions at will um, until 1848 in the case of Regina versus Hicklin which was a challenge to an 1857 law that authorized the destruction of obscene materials. So um, the US looked at that uh, definition of what, what is obscene and said, yeah, that's good enough. So uh, what would be obscene is anything that depraves uh, or can corrupts the minds of those who are open to immoral influences. So in 1848, who's going to be open to the corruption uh, uh, of immoral impulses, well, that's going to be women and children. Right? Uh, so it does not consider the work as a whole. If you have one little hell or dam in there, that's it. Obscene, we're done with it. Corrupt the children. No, don't corrupt the children. So, I'm with the <laughs> so in the uh, late 1800s in the US, you started to see these anti-vice um, uh, 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 societies start to, to crop up. Um, the Boston Watch and Ward Society, which was um, uh, organized by Henry Chase, and in New York, the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice, which was um, uh, organized by Anthony Comstock. So in Massachusetts, you already had um, a, a prohibition on anything that was obscene, indecent, or impure. Um, and so this gave the Watch and Ward Society um, a, a, a leg in, right, so that they could go around and police what was being published, what was being distributed. <clears throat> so Anthony Comstock, he's kind of the hero of my band books course, or anti-hero <laughs> maybe, right? Um, he was appointed um, U.S. Postal Inspector in 1873, um, and he served in that position until 1906. And he opposed everything obscene. And his definition of obscene was pretty broad. Um, it included obscene literature, um, information on abortion, information on contraception, information on gambling, information on prostitution, and information on patent medicine. <coughs> he even objected to um, anatomy textbooks at one point. 
uh, saying that they were uh, uh, very obscene, as they depicted the body. And his position as um, uh, a postal inspector gave him broad powers and a lot of political power in Washington, and he uh, influenced Congress to pass the Comstock Act of 1873, which basically said that you couldn't uh, send obscene material through the US mail, right? <clears throat> so the question then becomes, well, how are you going to define obscene? So <clears throat> it took about a century to really arrive at um, a definition. And in the meantime, we're basically relying on Hicklin. If it's not appropriate for the children uh, and the ladies, then it's, it's not appropriate to go through the mail. But that's a pretty narrow definition. And it, uh, it outlaws just about everything that you would want to read. So, so in 1933, in the case of the United States versus one book called Ulysses, Ulysses by James Joyce, um, it was uh, uh, banned from being imported into the United States. So Random House wanted to, uh, to import it, um, needed to be cleared by customs, um, and the question of the case became, did the work tend to stir the sex impulses or to lead to sexually impure and lustful thoughts? And the court ruled in favor of the book, which is why you can now take it out of the library upstairs today or buy it in a bookstore. And, uh, uh, <coughs> And, and what was said was that the adult literature should never be reduced to mush for infants. Right. <clears throat> a little later, 1957, uh, Samuel Roth was an adult bookseller um, who was brought up on charges of distributing obscene material. And uh, the finding in that case, which was in favor of Roth, was uh, that to be considered obscene, the work had to, uh, to consider whether the average person, average person is new, Right. Applying contemporary community standards, also a new idea, right? Acknowledging that uh, you know cultures are, are different um, in different regions and areas of the country, would find that the work uh, taken as a whole. Now we get this idea that you have to take it as a whole and not just a random word here and there. Uh, would appeal to the prurient interest. And in that case, also uh, the Supreme Court did agree that obscenity, um, uh, obscene work could be censored, um, could be um, uh, an exception to the First Amendment, but that that particular book was not obscene. So this set new um, obscenity standards. So it had to consider the work as a whole. Um, it had to consider the effect on the average person and not just um, an overly sensitive person. Um, and it had to take into consideration contemporary community standards. And so then finally, uh, Marvin Miller in 1973 was a pornographic film uh, and book publisher. And it wasn't even a problem with the porn pornography that he was producing. What he did was to advertise his business, he sent out a brochure to bookstores and, and film distribution sites. <coughs> and one of the owners of one of those bookstores was offended by the brochure, not even by the material, right? Um, and so charges were filed, and <laughs> in Miller versus California in 1973, um, still, again, we're taking uh, into account the work as a whole and contemporary community standards, <laughs> uh, acknowledging that obscene sexual content is defined by applicable state law, but then also introducing what we now call the SLAPS test. And in order <clears throat> not to be considered obscene, the work had to have serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. And if it can meet that test, then it is not obscene. And that is still the uh, standard that we're using today. Um, and we'll see, uh, as we look at some of the books that are, are being challenged, um, how uh, obscenity charges are, are brought against them. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. All right, so now we're going to bring it into the current day and talk about what's going on. Um, <coughs> present day trends. Deborah Caldwell Stone 
director of the ALA Office of Intellectual Freedom, stated in a New York Times article last year that during her 20 years with the organization, there's always been a steady hum of censorship, and the reasons have shifted over time, but I have never seen the number of challenges we have seen this year. Now it's 2021. So Art and I did a little research, and we decided, so how many articles about banned books were there last year? And according to what we found, there were 11 publications from the New York Times regarding the banning of books, as opposed, as opposed to only three in 2011. So that seems pretty significant to me. It makes sense. If we uh, did the math correctly, it's a 370% increase mm -hmm. over just a decade. So we decided to grab some of the uh, headlines so that you could see them. We could read a couple of them. Queer book bans aren't about books at all. Uh, Virginia school board members call for books to be burned amid GOP's campaign against schools teaching about race and sexuality. Book ban efforts spread across the U.S. Challenges to books about sexual and racial identity are nothing new in American schools, but the tactics and politi politicization are. Should I read one too? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> why a school board's ban on mouse may put the book in the hands of more readers. Book bans have reached levels not seen in decades, but nationwide, activism to oppose them is growing too. The fight to ban books, critical race theory battles hit libraries. Texas school district pulls 400 books from library shelves for review after legislature's inquiry. I can't read the book. <laughs> <laughs> I do the last one? Yes. Okay. Florida debates book bans in public schools, a roundup of Florida education news from around the state. Mm -hmm. How's that? <laughs> so we're going to do a quick video. We're going to talk about the top 10 books for 2020 and what the reasons were. Okay. So and I'll do my best to read the audio to play because it does not ever want to do it correctly. <laughs> American boys for profanity, drug use, considered anti-police. The absolutely true diary of a part-time media for profanity, sexual references, authors, content. Something else in their time for your divisive language considered anti-police. Elmore is a book for racial slurs and perception of the black and Number eight, Of Mice and Men, for racial slurs, racist, racist stereotypes. The Bluest Eyes, for graphic sexual violence. And number ten, The Hate You Give, for profanity considered anti-police. See anti-police a couple times in these challenges. <laughs> Oh, there's the audio issue. <laughs> All right. All right. So this is our poll. Which 2020 banned books have you read? So what's the big one? Let's, of Mice and Men? Yes. Yeah. Uh, of Mice and Men and To Kill a Bomb Homework mm -hmm. seem to be tied for the top spot. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. And followed by Tony Morrison's Low Side Lose I. and The Absolutely True Diary of Part Time Media. Unfortunately, we didn't have everyone's vote, but yeah, interesting. All right, let's read the next one. All right, so have you heard about the mouse challenge? Yeah, everybody? Has anybody read mouse? Yeah, I did. I don't have a copy. Our copy is taken out, which makes me feel good. So let's, let's do a little timeline here. 1980, Art Spiegelman published his graphic novel, Mouse, based off his father's experience in the Holocaust. This is from all of January. The McMinn County School Board, which is in Tennessee, votes to remove Mouse from their new eighth grade curriculum. After Mouse was removed, 
from McGinn's County School. Many copies were donated to local libraries. Mouse entered the top sellers list on Amazon and is still there as of the beginning of March. So I wanted to do just a little, a little background on, on an article that I had read about this. Um, let me get to it, move my phones. Um, there was an article published March 4th in the New York <coughs> Times by Sophie Casico. The article is about the broader issues of what's happening in Tennessee. It is titled, The Fight Over Mouse is Part of a big, uh, Bigger Cultural Battle in Tennessee, or as I would have titled it, A Slippery Slope. The article talks about proposed legislation prohibiting books that promote LGBTQ issues or lifestyles, among other issues. The article also notes that Governor Bill Lee recently announced a partnership with a Christian college to open 50 charter schools designed to educate children to be informed patriots. But on to Mouse. Um, as we know, Mouse is a new curriculum. Um, they bought it for the school system. Um, Mike Cochran, who is a school board member, had this to say about the new curriculum. It looks like the entire curriculum is developed to normalize sexuality. I, that's not, I'm not misquoting, I actually checked that. Normalize nudity and normalize vulgar language. He goes on to say, I think we need to relook at the entire curriculum. According to the article, the Mamink County decision to ban mouse was widely interpreted as a rejection or dis disregard for the Holocaust education. But school board members cited more narrow concerns. Several instances of inappropriate words, including bitch and goddamn, and an image of a partially nude woman. Emma Stratton, who's a, who is a high school senior, commented, if they take away this book, what else are they gonna take away from us? Adding, they're trying to hide history from us. Kaylee Isham, a ninth grade teacher in McGinn County, said she hesitates to tackle to topics like racism and socioeconomic or LGBTQ issues in her classroom for fear of being targeted by conservative parents. She states, we are allowed to say less and less. Our hands are tied behind our back at this point. Now I realize that I'm taking quotes that I feel are meaningful to this program. It's a fairly long article. I can certainly give you that information if you want to read it because there are several points of view in there. So I just don't want to tell you, that's not what the whole article about. They, they interviewed a lot of people. So I just wanted to throw that disclaimer in. All right, challenges, the reason for challenges. The biggest one, LGBTQIA+. Notable, one of the smallest ones in the bottom left corner is homophobic. Anybody else see anything that, that jumps out to them? What do we have? I saw a brainwashed children. Bodily function. Oh, is it bodily function there? Yeah. Bodily function. Bodily function. Probably just Ulysses. Oh, <laughs> extremely liberal. Alcohol. Alcohol. My favorite is ghosts. 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 Oh my God, that's ghosts. Ghosts. Inebriated awesome. mother. Is that where, where is that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and confusing. I can relate to that. I can. Yeah. Yeah. Humor. That's a great reason to ban a book. It's funny. All right. Okay. What do we got next? All right. I wanted to point this out. Oh, we wanted to point this out. So, challenging or banning something goes beyond just books. It's also about programs, social media, displays, films, and I don't know what the 7% of it is. But, I'm just going to, you don't have to raise your hand. We weren't even going to do this, but your gut reaction, if you want to raise your hand, um, would you allow a white supremacist group to reserve a room for a meeting? If you say, if you feel the answer is yes, raise your hand. If you feel the answer is no, raise your hand. Okay. So, Brian is going to give you some information. So, if you want, if you're while you're still considering it, um, yeah, that's you, Brian. Yeah, that's me. Yeah, good. Okay. Talk right. about. It. <laughs> All right. So, um, this uh, actually comes from the Los Angeles Times from uh, 2018, so not too long ago, just a couple of years ago. And it's, uh, it's uh, an article, I'm not gonna of course read you the whole article, but the gist of it is uh, that the American Library Association 
uh, took and is taking some heat because uh, their policy states that they are for libraries that allow hate groups to use the library facilities. So people were angry at that. If you're a public library, why in the world are you allowing hate groups to gather in the library? That's <coughs> terrible. Uh, what the ALA says, again, I'm just sort of cannibalizing this article. They say, <laughs> if a library allows charities and nonprofits and sports organizations to discuss their activities in library meeting rooms, then the library cannot exclude religious, social, civic, partisan, political, or hate groups from discussing their activities in the same facilities. Um, the ALA has consistently stated that hate speech is protected by the First Amendment. Um, and uh, that libraries, they go on, they say, libraries should comply with the ideals and legal requirements of the First Amendment. And we make room for offensive, bigoted, and biased speech in the libraries, and here's the kick, if it's just that, it's just speech. So we're talking, you know, even though we may find an idea repugnant or a group's ideals terrible, uh, the idea is, of course, that uh, according to the ALA, they should be able to use public spaces to, as vile as we may think some of their ideas are, to discuss these things. But the kicker is, if it then goes into, now let's plan an attack, or now let's plan some harassment of, of a group or an, a person, now we've moved into something else entirely, okay? That moves it into conspiracy. And that is illegal and not what the ALA is about. Uh, what the ALA is saying, of course, is that just that these groups, distasteful as they are, they have a right to, to talk about their ideas. But, of course, if they move into uh, planning uh, uh, things that are, are illegal, then and now we're in another category. That is not protected uh, speech under the First Amendment. So that is more than an academic question, as you can see. Um, I want to tell you about what happened in a public library in Wakefield, Mass. I don't know if anybody knows this story, but there was a group then called the Church of the Creator, now called Creativity Movement, that requested to reserve a room for a meeting about the group. It is a self-styled religious organization that promotes what it sees as the inherent superiority and creativity of the white race. The Southern Poverty Law Center, I don't know if anybody uh, knows about them, is a, it designated it as a hate group. I don't know when it received that designation. Like I can't, I don't have that information. But as you heard from Brian, the director could not deny that request. Mm -hmm. On the day of the meeting, they had extra security in a demonstration against the group outside the library. Their racist chants, Nazi salutes, and message, messages of hate are remembered by all who were there to witness. They have not been back to town since. Oh, so, again, Brian's back. Yep. Now back. we're going to talk about the decision. So, uh, you may think, okay, this is all very interesting and uh, what's going on out there, you know, in the world. But uh, we have decisions to make here at Holly Library on our campus. Uh, for example, we have these two books, The Story of Little Black Sambo and The Five Chinese Brothers, okay? And uh, has anybody read these books? Just show of hands. Okay, some people have read it, yeah. Uh, I remember growing up, I had read both of these books. Um, so we had them out, they're, they're, uh, they're children's literature. We had them in our, we have them in our collection. And uh, we discussed it as a, as a staff. We said, uh, you know, these books, I mean, they're, you know, they're just, they're, 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 they're offensive, they're, they wound. Uh, and so we were in the position of, well, what do we want to do about this? And I made the decision, rightly or wrongly, I'm human and, and quite fallible, and these things are always open for, uh, uh, you know, uh, revisiting. What, uh, what I decided to do, I said, well, we are an academic institution, mm -hmm. so we're not about censorship, even as we look at these depictions and we say those are terrible. So uh, we, have, we have children's literature classes, uh, we have sociology classes, we have history classes, 
uh, that uh, scholars may have a need to look at these books and everything that they represent at some point. So what we decided to do, what I decided to do, is we have them in the library director's office, in my office. So they are, except we're trying to thread the needle and walk a balance mm -hmm. beam, where a scholar that may need access to these titles uh, would be able to gain access to them with, you know, in the context of their work, while we're not leaving them out on the shelf like any other book, which someone unprepared could come across and be deeply wounded by seeing these depictions of people, uh, you know, other, other cultures, other people. So, you know, we want to be an academic institution, an intellectual institution, but we also are a human institution. So we're trying to, uh, as, as a college, and particularly in this instance as a library, we want to, we, we want to make sure that we, uh, we recognize our shared humanity and, and do our best not to harm or hurt, but at the same time be, uh, 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 be navigators for people who may need to get for informa to information for their own purposes. So rightly or wrongly, we're trying to walk that balance beam. Rightly or wrongly, we've moved these books from the general children's collection into uh, a, 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 you know, a more restricted space, but it is available. They are available. They're in the catalog. You can find them in the catalog, and you can request them uh, for, for access. And no one's going to give you the third degree on, on why you need to but see them. How would they request it for access? Can they put a hold on it? You could put a hold on it right there on the catalog. You could go to one of the reference librarians or circulation staff and say, I'm looking for this book, um, and we could, uh, we, could, we could get it for you. In fact, this is such a recent development. In fact, it was done as a consequence. This, this whole program, this was part and parcel of this. Um, you know, we may be, I don't think we've put any kind of an asterisk or any kind of a, a designation yet in the catalog as to a new location for it. So we'll have to follow through on that. But this is still um, you know, something that we've done fairly recently. But that's a good point. We want to make sure it's findable. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you, Brian. Sure. All right, so who initiates challenges? Well, you can see at the top, 50% uh, are parents, and 1% are students. And then you get 5% are librarians. There was an NPR interview with Judy Bloom in 2011. The article stated that over the years, concerned parents in communities around the country have had ser several of Bloom's books banned, including Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret. Anyone read that? Yeah. Blubber, and then again, Maybe I Won't, making Bloom a champion for supporters of intellectual freedom for young people. She is quoted as saying, I believe that censorship grows out of fear. And because fear is contagious, some parents are easily swayed. Book banning satisfies their need to feel in control of their children's lives. This fear is often disguised as moral outrage. They want to believe that if their children don't read about it, their children won't know about it, and if they don't know about it, it won't happen. So on a personal note, I have to say that my son Jack's here in the audience, and he's a great reader. And I like to share the books that I have read with him. I read The Absolute True Diary of a Part-Time Indian. And that's not an easy, is anyone else, has anyone read that? Yeah. That's not an easy book to read. There's a lot in there, it's a, there's a lot to it. He wanted to read it when he was 10 or 11, something like that. And I wanted him to read it because I was excited about it. But I realized that he may have been just too young for it at that point. And I asked him to wait a couple of years. He didn't give me a hard time about it. So I let it go, but Arden brought up a point that I wanted to, you know, to share when you talk. So if you want to say something, Arden, that Arden. Oh, well, I, I had a similar situation, yeah. and I, I took a, pretty much the opposite approach. Um, I was teaching uh, Vladimir Nabokov's Lolita, um, and I was, my daughter was 14 or so, and I was talking about the book. And, uh, she wanted to read it, and I said okay, and I handed her a copy, and she got into about maybe the second paragraph, and the writing style was just way beyond her ability. It was terribly boring, and she had no idea what was going on. She put it down herself. She's 22 now. I still don't know what she said. <laughs> <laughs> um, and similar to that, I like to note that um, 
children know what they are and aren't ready for. Um, adults often aim to like shelter kids, um, and I believe for the most part they're um, a lot smarter than we often give them credit for. Mm -hmm. Like they know what is like too far beyond their ability or what is too much for them personally to handle. Yes. All right, so, Matt Krause in his list. Yes, right. Matt Krause. Um, just a, a quick little uh, note before we get into who he is, really. Um, in 2015, regarding the Supreme Court case um, of the Christian bakers um, refusing to uh, bake a cake, a wedding cake, for a gay couple um, due to their religious um, beliefs, uh, he stated, should a Jewish bakery have to bake a cake for a neo-Nazi convention to come into town? Uh, I don't feel like I need to explain uh, how awful of a comparison that is, but um, and uh, it's to note that the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the baker in this case. Um, well, Matt Krause himself was a former attorney at Liberty Council, which is also an SPLC designated hate group, um, and he is a current member of the Texas House of Representatives, as well as being the chairman of the Texas Committee on General Investigating, which is relevant um, as because of that position, he was able to present Texas Public Schools with an 850 book long list of titles to be reported, as well as a list of topics that if they have books relating to any of these topics, they also had to be reported. And so, 850 books, it's a big number, kind of hard to imagine. You yeah, don't need to. This, yeah, that's, that's <laughs> these why. These are 850 books. Yeah, um, we thought we thought uh, you know yeah uh, some uh, you know a, a list is you know 850 things on a list is is one thing but uh, you know we just thought now these aren't the actual 850 books that are on the list. No, these are but, representation. But we thought well you know let's what does 850 books sort of you know you want to talk about just sheer volume of content. <laughs> so we grabbed Arden and I uh, did most of the heavy lifting and and Melissa thank you <laughs> Melissa. And we brought 850 books two. down here. <laughs> just so what's that? About two. A little bit, yeah, a little bit. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, so this is just to give you a sense of the sheer sort of amount of, of material that we're talking about that, that they're considering banning or you would like to this see. This is the lowest um, like end goal of what he is trying, like aiming to censor, um, because the list of other topics expands exponentially depending on who has what books. It, it was a lot of work. I was kind of hoping he had a list of like 20 books. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, you know, you know, about it. Yeah. so we just thought a little visual might be in order. Mm -hmm. You know, if we take this on the road, I, I, there's no way. I'm Put them all on a thumb drive <laughs> or something. Like that. Okay. All right, Arden. So, um, my Mugabe um, is the author of one of the books from this list. Um, the book called Genderqueer, a memoir, uh, Errol also a cartoonist, um, and um, it wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post which was titled, Opinion, Schools are banning my book, but queer kids need queer stories. And the following quote and images are from Air article. Uh, so the quote is, here are the sickos who wrote those awful books, wrote a commenter, tagging me, Kababe, and another author, Jonathan Edison. And image of Kababe. Um, so some panels from that article are, shoot, I guess I should have watched that video. Why are they mad about the book? Because I said non-binary and trans people exist. The book has been out for two and a half years. Why now? So this parent has never read the book and neither did her kid. She just wants to make sure no one else's kids can. Is this going to start a domino effect? One bad leading to another, to another? And short answer to that is sadly, yes. <laughs> You know, do you go back to that? Because, you know, that, what, what really bothers me about that, it really upsets me, is because I said non-binary and trans people exist. That really, that, that, that bothered me. Um, so, uh, a school that had banned gender queer um, eventually reinstated it. Uh, Fairfax County Public Schools later announced that it had restored the previously banned book to, er, to libraries after two committees had reviewed it. Um, <coughs> the review process is supposed to happen before a ban occurs, but it did not in this case. Um, so what the committee stated is that genderqueer depicts difficulties non-binary and asexuals individ asexual individuals may face, and that the book 
neither depicts nor describes pedophilia, which was the reason for the ban in the first place. And as you can see, uh, Gender Queer is a Stonewall Honor, um, Stonewall Book Award winner, um, which is a very high um, LGBTQ award that a book can win. All right. Has anyone seen the band posters on the campus? Yeah. Yeah, we did that on we did that on purpose. We, we had two stages. The first stage was let's just tell people those books were banned. You know, then they we picked titles that were familiar. Arden did. They picked um, so that you would like why is Harry why was Harry Potter banned? And then the second round of, of um, posters was want, you want to know why? And then again, you know, we put the information for the program and. We felt that since we were offering people, you know, to let them know why these books were banned, that we just wanted to, to lay them out here so that you could, you could know why they were either challenged or banned. Okay, so to go through some of them, or Harry Potter, uh, the reasons were magic and witchcraft and actual curses and spells. Side note, if you didn't already know, none of those were real. <laughs> <laughs> the Great Gatsby for language and sexual references, The Handmaid's Tale for profanity and vulgarity and sexual overtones, uh, Saga for being anti-family and having offensive language. Offensive language is also one of the reasons for I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, as, long, uh, as well as un being unsuited for the age group in question. Uh, Lord of the Rings, uh, my favorite on this list because the only reason it has ever been banned or challenged was for being satanic. Um, it was burned by a uh, church group, and that's the only time it has ever faced a challenge. And I think that's quite ironic, uh, with Tolkien being extremely Christian and basing many of the characters on angels, such as like Gandalf is an angel. Um, and he also is the reason that C.S. Lewis um, was converted to Christianity from atheism, which resulted in the Chronicles of Narnia being written. Uh, 1984 was uh, challenged and banned for being pro-communist and having explicit sexual matter. British Terabithia for occult and Satanism, as well as offensive language. The Hate You Give for profanity and an anti-police message. And To Kill a Mockingbird for profanity and racial slurs, as well as being degraded to African Americans, which Lori is going to touch on further. Yeah, I think this is a good example of how complex this issue is. Um, we did a little research, and there is a, a whole history of this book being banned uh, from different sources for different reasons. The first one that I could find was from 1977. It was temporarily banned due to words damn and whore lady um, that were used in the novel. 30 years later, um, it was challenged by a resident because they objected to the novel's depiction of how blacks are treated by members of a racist white community in an Alabama town during the Depression. The resident feared that the book would upset black children reading it. I actually did have a question. I hadn't heard of the slaps test before, but I had read a lot of the books that were cited. And, I, and most of them, well, the ones that I've read would all pass that test. Yes. So I'm confused about how they got banned, even though they're obviously of merit. Yeah, so um, most of the um, uh, challenges that we've been talking about tonight um, did not pass the, the legal muster. Most were, were reinstated. Um, and uh, the, the Miller um, versus California, that was uh, a state uh, case yeah. that was um, brought to the Supreme Court. So it is uh, the law of the land. Okay. Yeah. So uh, if, if you don't challenge the challenges, that's how you end up with the ban. Aha. Uh -huh. That is good to know. Many of those uh, books that were listed were also uh, banned before the slash test was uh, true, true, true. Yeah. Was put into place. Thank you. Yeah. I thought the, the question you posed about the white supremacist group and the reserving a room was a really interesting brain teaser. Um, but the first thing that crossed my mind, was, and I didn't shout it out, was it, it really has to do if it's public or private, mm -hmm. right? So I mean, if it's a public yes. space that is protected yes. by First First Amendment, if I understand, but if it's a private company or school, right, they have the right to refuse. Is that correct? Well, yeah, yeah. I guess you talked about on campus what what you would what do. What I would do, yeah. Happen? Well, I would I would um, if, if I was approached with uh, that sort of a you know can we can we use your space. 
I would beat feet right down to Sarah's office. <laughs> and uh, maybe then we could beat feet right up to College Hall uh, before I got back to, I, I mean, as, as part of, as Halley Library is, is, a, is a, a wholly owned subsidiary of Endicott College in a sense, you know, I mean, we are. I would want to make sure that the library's uh, goals and um, presence is fully, I'm being very diplomatic here, but I'd want to be fully in line with the wishes of the provost's office as well as College Hall. But as a so, private entity, right, we get to Yes, we could, to thank you, yeah. We, we would set. ultimately, uh, Endicott would make that decision, that determination. But personally, I, I would not, I, I, would, I would want to make sure that I was consulting with the provost's office and then College Hall to make sure that uh, there's a consistency of message there. Uh, getting out uh, both to the requestor as well as the community. So well, that, maybe for uh, next time we can, we can talk about what clothing they're wearing in this public space. Like, can they wear full Nazi regalia mm -hmm. when they come into the meeting? That's a very good question. Mm -hmm. I believe they did. For, well, I think they did for the Whitfield one. Yeah. Nora, I can speak a little bit to public library spaces. I, public libraries can, I mean, often they are compelled to, to allow any group, but they can write and do write policies that say, you know, if you're going to use our meeting room, you have to be maybe a resident of the town and you can't be selling anything and you can't be, you know, doing anything political and that kind of thing. So there are ways to kind of limit mm -hmm. issues, <laughs> but not outright ban um, certain groups. So. Yeah, there must be a, a lot of unsavory characters. I guess that's very biased with me, but that, you know, that they want to be lawful and within, you know, constitutional rights, but they want to find a way to yeah. not have them be there. Yeah, or put some serious limits on it. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to say that I appreciated the transparency uh, around the two books that as a library staff you had to consider. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've taught children's literature and use those as examples when we're learning about bias and stereotypes. and. Um, it, it, it kind of loops back to what Dr. Paradiso was talking about in terms of that community standards and, and cultures do change. Mm -hmm. And so this is an example of how a library can respond in a positive kind of academic way mm -hmm. to a mm -hmm. community standard and cultural shift that says that really isn't what we want young children to be reading because it's sending messages that are very detrimental um, about different groups, mm -hmm. and so I just I appreciate just the open discussion of that. Yeah, and it, it was something we want to. We have um, people from all over the world that come to study at Endicott College. People from different cultures, um, and we don't want anyone hurt. Um, we want to maintain that scholarly approach, but we are we're a community of human learners. That was the most. Uh, that was the way. And I did do some research. Uh, at you know it, it was it was. Uh, something that, 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 that we talked about quite a bit and I thought deeply on. And I think I, I, I've got it here because uh, part of the research I did was uh, there's a gentleman um, who is, uh, hang on here, my glasses are, uh, I guess so I can read my paper. Um, hang on one second, I'll grab it here. Okay, here it is. So uh, this is from NPR. They actually did a, an eight minute audio uh, on Little Black Sambo because there was uh, uh, a few years back, uh, 20, 2003, so I guess it was more than a few years ago, 2003, uh, another artist had come in, they kept the story, mm -hmm. and they redid all of the graphics mm -hmm. for Little Black Sambo. Um, that being said, uh, there's a gentleman, uh, his name is David Pilgrim. He's the founder and director of the Jim Crow Museum of Racist Memorabilia at Ferris State University. He's an author himself of several books. And he called Little Black Sambo the most controversial, painful, single children's book in terms of African-American portrayal. So in the, in the context of the NPR interview, he was saying, Could they, can we just not even bother with redoing this book? Let's just, he was strongly of the, just, just, just bury it. So uh, uh, I, I believe that the, other, the, the new version did come out. But, mm -hmm. uh, to, but reading this by, by David Pilgrim, reading, you know, listening to NPR, listening to David Pilgrim, reading his words and saying how painful this was, um, it, it, it really touched me and said, we, we've got to uh, respond. We want to kind of thread this, this needle so that it's available 
uh, and, and but done so with the sensitivity that we're not hurting anybody. So it's, but again, we want to be out there with it. So we're not trying to do something secret or sneaky. We're just trying to to respond as a, as a community or respond as representatives of our library. But certainly, uh, uh, all of these things are open for discussion, uh, for disagreement, for nuance, for new ideas. So. So it's not a, it's, it's always, uh, we, we do these things, we always have our ears open and want to be respectful of people's opinions and ideas. So if anything touches a nerve, um, you know, let us know uh, here at the library because we want to make sure that we're, we're in conversation with one another. Yeah. 